calm down. Hold on. Prime Minister, sorry. I pl- hold on, hold on. Prime Minister, I promise we'll have you on as soon as we can. It's the, it's the Prime Minister. He's angry with me. Yeah. <laughs> it's because I said I thought Nick Clegg was hunkier. That's what I think. It's on <laughs> That's what you call the smashing starts of the show. Uh, <laughs> good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Friday Night with Jonathan Ross. And let's start, shall we, by congratulating Amy Williams on winning Britain's first Winter Olympic gold. Shall we? Wasn't that incredible? <laughs> first one for 30 years. <laughs> wow. She's won the skeleton bob. Isn't it weird? Uh, you know, I don't really know about those sports until the Olympics come, and then suddenly I feel like I'm an expert on curling, on the skeleton bob, on the luge, <laughs> on the other bob. <laughs> all that. Up until a week ago, I thought skeleton bob was on the Simpsons. Now I think I know everything <laughs> about it. Uh, normally we're rubbish at the Winter Games, presumably, because being British, we arrive, they get settled in the hotel, they look out the window, it's snowing, they think it's been called off. <laughs> Back to bed. Oh, well done, Amy. Although she needs to be careful because the skeleton bob is a slippery slope. <laughs> really is. <laughs> Shall we see who's in my green room tonight, ladies and gentlemen? Why don't we? My first guest is the Maharaja of musicals, the Shah of show tunes, the Wazir of the West End, the Lord Lieutenant of lyricism, <laughs> the potentate of the piano, <laughs> Lord Andrew Lloyd Webber. There he is. Good to see you, sir. <laughs> now, Andrew. I'm delighted to say he's about to launch a new musical at the West End. It's called Love Never Dies, and it's basically the long-awaited Phantom 2. Sort of Phantom with a vengeance. Phantom harder. <laughs> Phantom, the squeakle. <laughs> Is it going to be a success? Does John Barrowman like Judy Garland? I think it's a dead <laughs> sir. Uh, and later, Andrew will be giving us a sneak preview of one of the spectacular songs from the show. That's Lord Andrew Lloyd Webber on the show this evening. <laughs> Lovely to see you again, sir. Thank you so much. Great to have him back. My next guest is one of the most visionary and unique directors working in mainstream cinema today. His work includes Batman, Edward Scissorhands, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. He is the wonderful Tim Burton. There he is. <laughs> hey, Tim, how's it going? Looking swift. I love Tim Burton. I'm excited because Tim's latest movie is a gritty docudrama highlighting the decline of the boiler-making industry in mid-70s Hartlepool. <laughs> Oh, no, sorry, that's Ken Loach. I'm sorry, no, he's... Uh, <laughs> his new movie is The Phenomenal Reimagination. It's a new version of Alice in Wonderland. That's Mr Timber, and great to see you here. <laughs> I've seen the movie, I adored it. And if we get time, we have another guest as well. He's worked with Tim on many of his movies and a couple of others you may have heard of, too. He's Johnny Depp, ladies and gentlemen. There he is. Hey, Johnny, how's it going? <laughs> oh, listen to that, listen to that. Oh. Someone calm down, calm down. <laughs> it's just flesh and blood. Apparently attractive flesh and blood, but I can't see it myself. <laughs> Everybody, uh, we're all very excited to join us on the show. Everyone's been very excited. I turned up this morning for rehearsals this morning. There were 19 puffs in a piano. That's how the news has come out. <laughs> Johnny, great to see you. Mr Johnny Depp, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Lovely to have you here. All right. Now... Just before uh, we get on with that, let me show you this picture. It's my favourite picture I saw in the newspapers this week. It's a picture of the world's strongest animal. Here it is. That is the Asian weaver ant. Right? And it can lift 1,000 times its own weight. Now, that, if you compare that to us, that would be like one of us lifting a house on our back. This is the whole house. I'm worried because imagine if they all got together. He's carrying something. They could carry just about anything off. And I know we sometimes have ants here, so I'm going to warn them in the green room. Please be careful if you see any ants. Oh, yeah! and make sure... Enemy to the anthill as fast as you can. We've got him, we've got Johnny Depp. <laughs> when we get back, there's what Edward Scissorhands. No. <laughs> <laughs> Stop them, they're, they're trying to steal Johnny Depp. <laughs> I think they've got away with it. And you know what that is? It's a very rare sighting here on BBC of Ant and Depp. <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> Shall we get my first guest out, ladies and gentlemen? Yeah. I think we should. He is a genius of musical theatre. The fellows are going to sing him on, so it's probably less of an introduction, perhaps more of an audition. Will you please welcome Lord Andrew Lloyd Webber? <laughs> May his lordship take a seat. Very, very lovely and nice to see you again. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. Uh, it's exciting when you're on the show, and especially exciting when I hear that kind of music coming on, and knowing, as I do, that imminent 
is the new Phantom of the Opera musical. I guess, do you call it a sequel or do you kind of approach it as a standalone thing? I don't know. I think it's got to be a standalone show. It's called Love Never Dies. And it's the story of the Phantom and Christine ten years later. And it's taken you 25 years. Was it 20 years or 25 it's, it's years? About, it's got about 20 anyway. Because I didn't really find a story I really I liked very much. And about three years ago, Ben Elton, uh, of all people, said, look, I think I've got a way through this. And I found it. Wow. So Ben came to you with the, uh, the new Phantom story. He kind of unlocked it for me, yeah. Did you have the tunes in your head already? Did you have an idea of what I you had might one uh, from some time ago. Uh, but no, all the other ones were new. And uh, in fact, I don't quote anything from the old show hardly at all. I don't quote any of the main songs. So you don't use, when you say quote, you mean you don't use that, the same kind of musical refrains and flourishes? No, I don't use, well, I hope there are some musical uh, yeah. refrains and flourishes. But uh, no, it, it's a, a deliberate decision that I didn't want to use any of the old tunes, you know, from the old show if I could possibly help it. So it's all new? Yeah. Which is yeah. what we have a right to expect because tickets will be, what, 15 quid, 20 quid? So I think we. <laughs> you know, more than that. <laughs> Uh, how, uh, how, much pressure, <laughs> how much pressure do you feel under, though, uh, knowing that the expectation is so high? Because uh, it's one of, if not indeed the most successful uh, production of musical theatre of all time, I believe. Yeah, it's a slightly weird one, in a way, because I recorded the whole show last year. So, by September of last year, I knew exactly where I was going with it. And now it's just a question of whether the production... And we're in that thing called previews at the moment, which uh, means that, of course, the actors are all standing around waiting for the scenery to hit them. And it's all sort of, you know, everybody's very, very tense. You know, we haven't yet had a chance to really get at the music and really make it all work. But kind of come the end of the week, I'll know. Uh, I, I have a sort of second sense sometimes about how, how these things are working. And I do know that there are big chunks of it that are, really seem to be landing very effectively. So you never know. Do you get nervy, though? I mean, you said that the rest of the crew... Are you someone who kind of... Because you, you, or do you feel confident that if there are small problems, you can fix them quite easily? Well, of course one gets nervous. Of course one can, because you can't control certain things. Like our, our leading lady got, you know, a virus last weekend, so we missed, like, three technical rehearsals, we like, missed the first preview because we couldn't make it because we didn't have her. And uh, it's one of, those, uh, one of those things, you can't control that sort of thing. But what you can be fairly sure of is, is that if the work itself is going to be OK, then eventually it'll all work out. Okay. Is there any truth uh, to the rumour I've heard that you're writing a musical ab about and to star Jedward? Is that Jedward? Is, yeah. <laughs> well, it's a two-edged sword. Don't boo the Jedward. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you get, though, do you get a lot of uh, young people, like young performers, do they come up to you, do they ask for parts and parts, or do they uh, give you tapes? It's a very, very weird thing. We've just been doing the auditions for uh, another show called Over the Rainbow, where we're looking for Dorothy for The Wizard of Oz. And I've been seeing some of these very, very young kids who are coming in, and they, they'll, come, they'll sing, a say, an Avril Lavigne song, or they'll sing Lady Gaga or something, and then they'll do a song from a musical, and you say... You're 16. I mean, where did you get all of this from? And I think since we started doing the musical TV shows, that there's a whole generation that now thinks musical theatre is something that they want to do. Yeah, yeah. which is a good thing, I which guess. Which is so, fantastic, yeah. because it's actually turned around all sorts of areas of theatre. I mean, it, we, when we did Joseph the Amazing Technical kind of Dreamcoat in this very studio, uh, what we found was is that a lot of kids were putting themselves down for the National Theatre, for the £10 tickets that they have in the National Theatre. It's a fantastic idea, that. And, of course, they hit War Horse. And War Horse has been a fantastic success yeah. for young people. Yeah, yeah. So theatre, I think, all over the country now, I think, has benefited from the programmes. Have you, um, but have you found that people kind of think of you now as being a judge primarily on these shows and don't necessarily, are either not immediately aware or don't know that you're still working in musical theatre yourself? You? I don't know if anybody was ever aware that I worked in musical theatre. <laughs> 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 you never know. Uh, I, I mean, I happen to enjoy working with the kids. I, I love working with young people. I and mean, the last time I was on your show, we had Jade. And look, now she's the lead singer of The Sugar Babes. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the ones that have been big hits you over the years, of course, and you don't even know, but with Starlight Express, Cats, all these, you're going back to Phantom. Would you consider a sequel to any of the other musicals that you've done in the past? No. I mean, I think the story of The Phantom and Christine, I think it happens that what Ben Elton unlocked, and uh, you know, I think the, the script of the new one is very, very good, I think is a fantastic story. I wouldn't have been interested in it remotely if I didn't think that it was a standalone good story, and I don't think you have to have been to the old shows who have seen the new one. In fact, in many ways, 
Um, I'm more interested in what people who haven't seen the old show think of the new one than those who have. There can't be that many out there who are going to go, who rush to see it, who haven't seen it. You'd be surprised. Uh, well, you know, I, I'm disappointed because I had some ideas I wanted to run past you. Because cats, I thought, could do with being. And you know, I wasn't a big fan of cats. No, you know I know. Well, you I know, dogs everywhere. Yeah, well, I love dogs. This is what I thought. Have a look. See if this idea. Does that grab you at all? <laughs> what have we got here? <laughs> um. No? No? Not really. Okay. I don't. Not, not here's, sure. my, here's my starlight sequel for you. Yeah. Gatwick Express. Because <laughs> we can all associate with that. Yes, I know. Gatwick Express is very slow, isn't it? <laughs> it's no, it's you know, a good time. Yeah. Uh, are you um, are you excited about this? Because uh, you know it's quite a, a remarkable change in your life in the last few years. Suddenly becoming as public a figure as you are. People who like musicals knew who you were, and you were cropped up on shows occasionally. But suddenly there you are when you're doing the, the TV shows. You're there every Saturday night. And people know who you are, they know what you do now. It's, it's kind of a big, a big change for you, I would have thought. Do you enjoy that now? Yeah, but I do like it because I like working with the young people. I love bringing the best out of performers. And really the fun of it is what you almost don't see on television. Mm -hmm. is when you can actually say to something, come on, sing that song slightly differently and let's see what happens. And you find kids come alive. There was a, there was a fantastic moment, which I was really pleased with, uh, last summer, when all five of the finalists of the I Do Anything programme were in Leeds in the West End. Yeah. Um, that was great, because, I mean, you suddenly think, well, it, it can't just be... That, that probably wouldn't have television. happened without that show. It's not, you know, well, I don't know. There's one kid who comes from Belfast who is um, in my new show... I'd never have seen her. Yeah. I'd never have seen her in a million, million, million years. Yeah. So, it got, so it's opened up so many opportunities for so many people. I think so, and I think it, it really does introduce people to theatre who maybe never would have thought of anyone going near any. I mean, so it's not just me or, or the programme on their own. It is lots of other things happened at the same time. But I really do think that the television does something which is, you know, unusual. You, um, you're, you're much more of a public figure now than you were before yeah. these things happened for you. And I was curious as to... Uh, I was reading about the, uh, the ill health you suffered recently. Yeah. And, and I, this was... Uh, and I thought you, it, was, it was very admirable the way you dealt with the head-on. I don't know how many people know this, but you, it was quite a major scare you had, wasn't it? Well, I had prostate cancer, and, um, you know, I was diagnosed with it. Luckily for me, I uh, just finished recording Love Never Dies, and unusually for me, I had a couple of months, and they said to me, look, um, I think we ought to deal with this, you know, and, and I thought to myself, let's just get rid of it. I was very, very lucky because uh, I thought originally I had an infection, and in fact I had, uh, but if they'd found the infection, I don't think they would have found the cancer. So that would have been a, a much bigger uh, And it problem. would have been a much bigger deal, but luckily, I mean, touch this, I mean, I'm in the clear, and it, it, I, I can't see <laughs> why... Why people are so frightened about, about talking about because it? Because am I right in thinking that those around you thought maybe you should keep it quiet? You yeah, I mean, all the sort of PR lots said, you know, say you've got flu or an E. coli infection or something, this, that, and the other. And I said, no, I haven't. I've got cancer. And you might as well say it because it, it's, it is the most common cancer to affect men in, in the world. I think it, 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 the statistics about it are really quite, quite frightening in a way about the number of people who potentially have it. But it is one of the few cancers that you can absolutely nip in the bud. Yeah. And I've been lucky, and, and they have. And so, you, so you would advise everyone, uh, there's a certain age where you should go for the checkup. Well, you should just it. go and just check and just see whether or not, because it's a very simple blood test. Well, no, the, I went in, they put a camera up my jacksy when I went in. Oh, well, <laughs> yes, well, we go into all of that. There's quite a lot more that they do as well. Well, no, that, no I uh, only had the camera up that. That was enough uh, for me. I was out the door. And, uh, and I still listen, had it dangling out my and, backside and, and, when and, I was trying to get the lift going. Are we going to see some of the films? I did show the footage on the show oh, already. Did, we, yeah, we put a bit of music behind it. It was like a David Attenborough documentary. Well, can I score it? <laughs> That's a great musical for you. My insides. Uh, who was it uh, who rallied around you? Uh, this, this is a scare you have, and it's obviously a major... You know, anyone who goes through that, it's a, it's a shock, I'm sure, and it's a, it's a, you know, it's a worrying thing, it's a, uh, a frightening thing. When, when you were getting through it, who was there for you? Who came to see you? What, what, what were the kind of... Well, actually, I have to say, I mean, it was apart from my wife, Madeline, but, I mean, the whole gang rallied round, um, you know. I mean, particularly Tim Rice, funnily enough. And, I mean, not funnily enough, he was absolutely fantastic. And Cameron McIntosh and um, my first wife, uh, Sarah. We had one um, quite funny incident where my first wife, Sarah, who hadn't seen Tim for years, but, of course, went back with Tim way before Jesus Christ Superstar. I mean, we're talking, you know, years... Uh, so sort of the early, well, late 60s. And uh, so she's in the hospital, and of course I might as well not have been there because they just immediately started old times, you know, and what was this, <laughs> and blah, 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 blah. And the phone goes. So I think, who's that? The phone goes, Sarah Brightman. I thought, 
Oh, no. I mean, of all of the people to ring me <laughs> right there and right now, uh, Sarah. And uh, I put the phone down and... Uh, oh, I that's said, nice of you. Yeah, well, I, I, well, I mean, I haven't been extremely nice to Sarah since nobody was talking to me anyway. And I said, uh, that was Sarah Brightman on the phone. And my first wife said, well, she never had good timing. <laughs> <laughs> um, was there a big press uh, scrum outside? Did you have to sneak out? Or were well, they, it's they... all very well, all this. I mean, yeah, there was. I mean, well, I, I was quite excited about this because the matron came up and she said to me, look, so there's a vast posse of photographers out there. Oh, you know, we're going to have to get you back through, uh, through the dustbins, you see. So I thought to myself, uh, as I passed the dustbins, I wonder if the prostate's in there, actually. But then, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, I, bit, I, so I was slunk out and uh, all, all was fine. I can't think many people would think that. I'll well, I don't know. Think I, I think it just occurred to me, you know, and I was told that it was a scandalous thought. I mean, so I get in the car, go home, it's all fine. You know. Next morning, I pick up the papers, and there's a picture of Amy Winehouse leaving the same hospital, having had a boob thing. <laughs> they weren't for me at all. <laughs> From Miss Winehouse. You didn't get anything enhanced while you were there at the same time. No, but no, apparently it's very fashionable. It's the, all the in well, I think it's a reduction you have. But men can have it done as well. Men can yeah. have uh, oh, yeah. the, the but muscles. I, I, I think it's a reduction. Yeah. That is, is, is... What you mean is you think it's a reduction I should have. You're well, it's a reduction I should have. <laughs> um, uh, it's so lovely to see you well. I'm so thrilled you are because, you know, it's a, it's a terrible thing to go through. I know that. And you've bounced but, right back and you're back and you've got the new music coming out and you're back on TV as well. The operation itself. Is that done? Is that a conventional thing? Is that a big deal? Well, it is quite a big deal. I mean, I, I was a little bit unlucky because um, they hit an appendicitis that I had when I was three. And uh, obviously the guy who did it then did it with a meat cleaver. And so there was that, you know, I had to hack through to, to get it. But apart from the thing is, I'm, I'm around and I'm back and, uh, you know, yeah, you just have to get through these things. Yeah, yeah. And do you know what? Uh, I, I, I just thought, I know it's going to be fine. Uh, I mean, the number of friends around, you know, who just did rally around was so extraordinary yeah. that it makes you, makes you really think uh, when, you know, who has been with you for all of the years and who's been with you over your career and, and I was just, in a way, I mean, I was probably more moved by that than anything in, you know, that's happened to me for a long time. But that's a lovely thing, I mean, that's, and that's when you kind of take stock and you, you get back in touch with what's important, I guess. Yeah, I, th I think so. And uh, you, you also realise that if you're lucky enough as I've been, to be able to do the thing in life that I love doing and have been successful at it and can still continue to do it, that's the most fantastic gift that anybody could give to you. Uh, that's what a wonderful thing to hear. Uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing the show. You're going to look for a Dorothy. We are. OK, steady. And you're also going to yeah, be looking no for... Camp Dorothy Jones. Are you looking for a Toto as well? Toto, You're yes, looking for the, the dog, dog as well? Yes, the dog. OK, <laughs> so yeah. do you want people to bring their dogs in? Should we encourage people to send photographs uh, to you of their I, dogs? Um, is this something um, that you're welcoming? Uh, there is a mechanism in place, as they say. <laughs> no, dogs, I think, uh, have been coming from all over the place. And they're going to do uh, it with a real dog on stage. It's not going to be an actor or an actress dressed uh, as a dog. Uh, not unless it's a very, very small actor indeed. But what if there's a song for the dog? You might have a dog song. I mean, Toto could have a oh, song. Could do. Could do window. Uh, how much is that doggy in the window? Could you do that backwards? Can I? No, I can't. Window and the doggy that is much how. <laughs> Tell raggedy one with one thee. Window and the doggy that is much how. Sell four doggy. Hope that do I. <laughs> um... Oh, I got that the wrong way around. That's. Uh... That's what kids did before the internet, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> and I still can't work that. Uh, I'm so thrilled because uh, this is exciting, ladies and gentlemen. Andrew Lloyd Webber is going to perform uh, with the young lady, the lead of Love Never yeah. Dies. What is her name? It's Sierra, Sierra Boges. Sierra Boges. And another pianist is joining you? Yes. A lovely little girl called Lou. Louise Hunt is going to join you and is going to perform. Uh, this is the big number from Love Never Dies. This is Love Never Dies. Love Never Dies itself. You can perform that right here for us, ladies and gentlemen. But join me in saying thank you, will you, to Lord Andrew Lloyd Webber. Thank you, sir. Okay, over you go. You. Welcome to Friday Night with me, Jonathan Ross. Welcome to Alan Carr, China! <laughs> Shall we get my next guest out, ladies and gentlemen? Yeah. Will you please welcome Mr Tim Barton and Mr Johnny Depp, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Here we go. Great to have you both here. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you know... 
Uh, yeah, it's great to have you both here, and I'm really pleased you're both here together because uh, I know you work with other people and you, you do other movies, but when I think of your movies, or when I think of your movies, I tend to think of you as a pair. Uh, and you've been together, what, is it 20 years now that, that uh, Edward Scissorhands first brought you together? Yeah, one journalist said we have been working together for 10 decades. <laughs> which was before film was, you know, everything yeah, like that. Yeah. So I'm trying uh, to work that out. Yeah, yeah that's a strange yeah. thing to say. Uh, was Johnny the person you had in mind for Edward Scissorhands, or was it a, a film you were writing anyway, and then you were looking around for the right person? No, I didn't, you know, I'd never seen the show he'd done, 21 Jump Street, but I knew about him, and uh, I just, after I met him, I realized he was that character, you know, somebody who, you know, he's always been sort of misperceived by looking like a, you know, poster boy, and inside there was always something different, and that's sort of what the character of Edward Scissorhands was. And yeah, so, so I mean, you were kind of a teen idol at the time, and that TV show, you were kind of a, a heartthrob in all the teeny magazines and they stuff? Were, uh, they were working hard to process uh, some kind of uh, a character to shove down people's throats. And I was, rep I was misrepresented, really, I mean, I, you know, because as far as I was concerned, I was just an actor doing a job. You didn't enjoy that whole side of it? Well, I mean, I don't know that anyone... Can. It's pretty weird. You, yeah. know? you know, when you go from, like, not being able to pay your rent and then suddenly, you know, all that kind of bizarre hoopla and... So you were deliberately looking to uh, change the direction of your career and change the way people perceived you, I guess? Yeah, I wanted to... I just... I wanted the... You know, I wanted the, the road that I wanted, you know. I didn't want... Uh, I didn't want to become anyone's product, really. You, you know, a... here's what's weird. Uh, you're talking totally differently to the way I uh, expected you to, because <laughs> I haven't seen you being yourself for quite a long while, and I'm used to you either speaking like this, like a crazy person, or, oh, what a worse white chocolate. You know, it kind of... <laughs> you do those voices in the films, and here you're talking like a, a grown-up man. <laughs> that's it's weird, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I expected it's like kind of like normally... It's like a Michael Jackson voice. <laughs> 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 But I guess you, uh, you, we don't see you being interviewed that much, and I guess that's uh, deliberate on your part. Occasionally I become a grown-up man, too. Yeah. <laughs> but you're not a, you're kind of a weird person, I imagine, though, aren't you? Because that's what, <laughs> obviously... Because I don't see you playing normal people often. I've been accused of weird, yeah. yeah. I've yeah. been accused but of you weird. You like being a bit weird, don't you? Well, I mean, I just like to sort of, you know, I, I prefer to go down the, the road that I... That I prefer. Yeah. <laughs> He's weird. Yeah, yeah. And, and coming weird. from you, that's quite something because you're you're <laughs> you're no stranger to the weird side of life, are you? Well, I mean, what's weird? You know, I mean. You uh, two are. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we got a we got a double help in the weird. But uh, do you go to Johnny first because this partnership it clearly works and it's clearly something that you both feel comfortable with. Um, but you do, uh, you know, make other films with other people. Uh, do you prefer working with Johnny? Is it your first port of call when you have a part? Or are there certain parts where you, you don't go to him because you, you don't think it's a good mix? No, I think I always go to him if I feel the part's right and think he'd like it. And, uh, you know, also he's, you know, he's willing to try anything. And he also doesn't like looking at himself. I don't, he's never seen a movie that we've done together. You don't watch yourself back? I can't stand it. Yeah. Because you're unattractive, is that it? Is that it? <laughs> no, really, what, you just don't like seeing yourself on the screen or you don't like the performance? Uh, what I prefer, I just prefer to walk away with the experience of the process and, and have, you know, to, just to have that and, the, and then that's plenty. I don't, should, I don't you need should to watch them, though, because some of them are pretty good. <laughs> and, uh, I might, you know, I, this one I think I might, I want to see because this is, it, it's, it's Tim at his, at his, you know, utmost. He's really gone far beyond. On this one, and well, I, this I is it's a see. remarkable experience. I mean, I've seen this. This is Alice in Wonderland we're talking about now, Alice in Wonderland, and it's um, it, it's not uh, the straightforward telling of the story as we recall it. Of course, this is a, a different uh, a different angle on it. It's a different period, isn't it? Right. Well, I mean, I've seen there's been 20 versions of it, I guess, and they've all tried to, I, in some ways, be very literal to the stories, which are absurdist and don't really have a yeah. really strong linear. So what I liked about this was it sort of set it in a different framework, but just you know, still the thing that always I remember is the Lewis Carroll characters, you know, the Hatter and the Cheshire Cat. They're just such iconic characters, and that's the thing we were focusing on. It's a, a remarkable movie. I mean, it really is a very different thing, and I, I, I genuinely adore it, and so did my kids, I'm pleased to say. Um, but it's really quite way out there. I mean, it isn't, it isn't a kind of straightforward fairy story. It isn't like the, the cartoon Alice from years ago. Well, I mean, people, they go like, well, it's darker or something, and then you had to go, this was written, what, 18, whatever, and it's like, uh, well, you know, there's something that says, drink me, eat me, you know, that you don't know what it is. It's completely politically incorrect in a certain way that the story, you know, and this was, you know, as we said, if this story were written now, it would be kind of mind-blowing 
today. today. Yeah. And you know, it's it's been such an inspiration for musicians, artists, and so it's just, you know, it's in the subconscious of everybody in some way. And you play the Mad Hatter as if he is somewhat mad. Um, is that, um, presumably that's a deliberate thing. You went in there hoping to capture him as a sort of, not, not a kind of insane person in a, in a depressing way, but someone who is touched by madness. Yeah, someone who's, someone who's touched by madness, but confused by the madness as well. I mean, I think it's, the idea is that, you know, if you're completely crazy and you're unaware of it, you're home free. If you're completely crazy and you are aware of it, there's got to be some bit of trauma there. There's got to be some bit of damage there. You got to be, you know. So, so that what we were trying to do is kind of turn him into this, uh, you know, like a like a human mood ring in a way. You know, that, that um, he goes from, uh, you know, severe <laughs> severe sort of depression to um, um, great levity and then you know intense rage. Kind of like people sometimes bipolar people swing from that, one extreme to another. That sort of thing. Yeah. I, I think it's um, one of your, if not your best performance ever. Wow. I think thank it's incredible. You. Wow, thank you very much. You must be thrilled with the way it's turned out. Well, it's, you know, I just finished it, so, you know, it's like they have to take it from your cold, dead hand, you know. This yeah. But you so must have, it's... you've kind of literally just finished it. I mean, it's yeah, only yeah, a, yeah. the last week or two, yeah, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. My hands still smell like chemicals. <laughs> yeah. It's got nothing to do with the movie, that's just... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> um, how, has, uh, how have you seen each other change over this 20-year period? I mean, you've both uh, been through similar experiences in a way. You've both gone through, you were both kind of... Successful, but you enjoyed bigger success as a result of your time together and as other movies. You've both settled down, you've become family men. So you've been on similar journeys, but have you seen changes in each other that you didn't expect to see? Tim has to fight less for me now to get me into, into the movie. Yeah, after used to, Charlie, that was the first time fight, the you know. studio said, hey, what about, you know, Johnny, this yeah. guy, you know? But that's, that's right. weird, because people now, they think of you as a huge star. But of course, for years, you weren't. You were in these weird, oddball movies, and they weren't necessarily a, a big opening. I think opening. the definition was box office poison, was what, they, <laughs> was what they used to call me. But it's so weird to think about now. And I guess it was Pirates of the Caribbean that turned that around? I think that had something to do with it, yeah. OK, uh, how did they deal with your performance? Because, once again, this is something after the event, you say, sure. That's going to work. But at the time, I bet when you first walked out, oh, where, what are you doing all that? What are you doing? <laughs> That's not a bad impersonation, I think. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but they must have uh, questioned that, I'm sure. They were definitely, most definitely upset, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you had sit-down chats with them about this? Oh, yeah. I mean, sitting in a, you know, in a, in a great big, uh, you know, like a giant conference room, uh, speaking with grown men about, you know, how many gold teeth and how many, you know, dangly bits from your hair. So they had a, they wanted surreal. a limit on the number of dangly bits in your hair? And... Pretty much. I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was very strange. But you must have been confident then that you were doing it right. You must have had that belief in... Oh, I did. I mean, I, you know, I, I didn't do anything differently. I mean, I made choices for a character that I believed in and I, and I knew who that guy was. And, and uh, so I basically just said to them, look at it, you know, I, uh, this, is, this is the guy and, and if you don't like him, uh, you're welcome to fire me. Yeah. You, know, you can pay me. <laughs> but, uh, it's just kind of a win-win situation for you, really, much, at that you know. stage. <laughs> um, but they, you know, phenomenal success. I mean, uh, all three of them. And there's a, the fourth on the way. Is that is that confirmed now? There is. Yeah, there's a fourth on the way, and we're, we're you know, getting through the script and coming up with some. That's really exciting, fun isn't stuff. it? Yeah. It is. uh, and this will be the same director. Is it Gore Verbinski? This next? is a different director this time. It's uh, it's Rob Marshall, who just uh, did Nine and has done uh, Chicago, and he's very, very, very oh, interesting okay. guy. So you didn't want to. It's going to be a musical yeah. then. Huh? He's he's. <laughs> yeah, <we're just laughs> musical. Yes. <laughs> well, you've done the musical, of course, Sweeney Todd. Oh, and yeah. who would have thought we'd seen you sing? Because when you were in a band years ago, you just played uh, was it guitar, guitar or bass? Guitar, guitar. Yeah. So you weren't a singer on stage. Never. But you did a good Sweeney Todd. Did you see Johnny and Sweeney Todd, ladies and gentlemen? He carried a tune. He was channeling Bowie for part of that movie, I think. Uh, did, did you like doing the singing as part of the film experience? No. <laughs> no, I didn't. It made me incredibly uncomfortable. You know, at the, you know, to step up in front of a microphone, you know, for the first time in your life at the age of 40 or whatever, it was like pretty obtuse. Unpleasant. And now in the new film, of course, uh, Tim's encouraged you to dance on screen as well. Yes. Yeah, and it's quite some dance. Is that, presumably some of that is computer generated, the dance? No, the futter whacking. Yeah. No, it, it, That's the name of the bit... dance, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, just to know, but you, yeah, you've got to be, when it first occurred, I thought, what's that going to be when you say he's going to futter whack at the end? <laughs> I thought, this is going to be good, can Literally. I watch this with the kids? What's yes. going to happen? <laughs> and, and it's, uh, but it's quite something. Yeah, I'm not allowed to do it. The doctor's given me a month to not uh, I have whack. to stay away from my photo whack. You coward. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the knee, you know. Oh, it's the knee, Johnny. That's why. You can't dance because of the knee. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Tim might be able to show you a little bit, huh? 
can't make my head spin around. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, Keith Richards, of course, appeared in the last of the Caribbean movies with yep. you. Uh, and you're a huge and marvelous. I know you're making a film about him, aren't you? We're doing this. It's a thing that we've talked about for, for a number of years now that we finally had a moment, the two of us, to get together and, and uh, do like a, a, a first installment, if you will. And so basically, what it, all it is is exactly what Keith and I have been doing over the years, is sitting around in hotel rooms talking, gabbing, having a drink, and we, we've documented it. So it's something we're doing together, and uh, it, we did five, five days, and it went extremely well. He was just incredible. At the time still, though, even though, I mean, obviously, you're, you're comfortable where you are and who you are, but there are times when you're sitting, I'm sitting opposite Keith Richard. Do you oh, yeah. still have that feeling? Oh, it happens all the time, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, when he starts, you know, bringing up things about, you know, the early days of the Stones and, you know, you know, being, be, being uh, you know, whisked out of hotels through laundry chutes and things like that. You just there, must be, there must be some chunks of that period that he can't remember with absolute clarity, though, I imagine. <laughs> yeah, I gotta say, you know, he's got a pretty good memory <laughs> through for what he did. He's got a pretty great memory. Uh, I'm sure, like many people, when I saw the first parts of the Caribbean and realised that you were partly kind of like doing a Keith, the idea that you might be on screen together was an exciting one. Then when it finally came to be, what a great moment. <laughs> Let me ask you about the, uh, the, the, presumably you like the Pirates movie as well. Do you as a director, when you see other people's work there, do you sit there thinking, that's great, but I would have done this, I would have done that? No, because I know what's involved in making a film. So, no, I, I, I don't. I just worry about what I'm doing. And, uh, you know, it was great that, because uh, his success on that made it easier for me to work with him again. You yeah, know, I didn't have to, you know. Yeah. But I'm amazed because, I mean, it's a, a remarkable process. And, it, and obviously, when there's big money involved, which there is, for, for people to trust people like you to make something as strange as the films you tend to choose, mm -hmm. uh, that's a big risk by then. And yet, you guys don't seem that flustered about it. You seem like, I'm going to do this. You have that confidence in your own vision or your own ideas. Was that always the case, Tim? Yeah, I mean, it's confidence or stupidity or just ignorance <laughs> or whatever. But it's just kind of the desire to make what we wanted. And you know, I've been lucky from the very beginning to, you know, from... You know, scissor hands. Even though they didn't really want to do it, but you know, after Batman, I got a chance to kind of just do a low budget kind of thing. So I've been had the chance to, you know, do the things I've wanted to do. You're both very successful men working in an industry which is primarily an American industry. So, and yet you both choose to live elsewhere. You you live over here, uh, yes. more or less full time, as far as I know. And you live mainly in France. Is that right, Johnny? Yeah, in France, but also just you know, it's a pretty transient existence. Why? Uh, why is your main base in France then? Why did you choose France and not England? What, what France has done for me really is like you know, at least living in Europe has given me uh, uh, the opportunity for real uh, simplicity as far as as far as you know, raising a family, being a dad. You know, you, when we go down to our place in the south, there's no you know, there's no discussion, there's no movie talk, there's no nothing. It's just you know, literally simple and and uh, free i guess in los angeles it's so much a kind of the, the industry dominates the whole town that even I mean, schools and even restaurants when you go out it's always there everywhere you go i mean everywhere you go and you like you like a glass of wine occasionally don't you johnny i don't mind it okay. I don't mind. Um, <laughs> and you have your own uh, your own vineyard is that right I don't. I you don't. don't. You know, they were, the French won't allow it. I thought you had a vineyard. They don't want me to have a vineyard. Okay, and this is because you just you, you wouldn't be able to grow it. Uh, they just want you to keep drinking their stuff. I'd probably never leave. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, do you guys uh, hang out together or see each other much when you're not working together? I mean, we've talked about about your your home life. Uh, you're here uh, in the UK now. You're living with Helen, as you said, yeah. Helen Bonham Carter, and you have uh, two children. Yes. Yeah. Beautiful children. Uh, do you guys sort of go see each other much? Do you hang out? Do you socialise? Do you, do you bond? Do you go drinking, bowling? Do you go fishing? Do you do any of those things? Shopping? I forgot ice dancing. Yeah. Ice dancing. Synchronised yeah. swimming. Synchronised swimming. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, yeah, no. I mean, when we work, we see each other all the time. Yeah. Well, when, I mean, if we have to be in the same place or something like that. We'll do you, do you holiday so. together ever? I don't even holiday with my own family, so <laughs> I'd really be in trouble if I holiday well, you know, with him. Yeah, but it's, it's just family. a phone call Jeez. away, Tim. Just phone him up and say, hey, we're thinking of going to Centre Park or somewhere. What are you doing? I'm sorry, <laughs> holiday kids. I'm off to the Bahamas with Joe. No, I'm not yeah. saying you should go alone with him and his family and leave yours at home. I'm saying both groups of family book, you'd probably get a better rate and go and stay somewhere together. <laughs> Um, but I imagine it would be kind of like, uh, not, not like working, but it would be a continuation of, of work if you were away together. You would find yourself talking about those kind of things. Well, we'd probably develop like strange things like, you know, like Martin Landau's Hot Tub. Oh, yeah, we, like yeah, TV we... shows. We've dreamed up TV shows. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Martin Landau, of course, worked with you both in, in the Ed Wood movie. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what, what was the idea for the Hot Dog we'll TV show? just have a, like a, talk a talk show. show. We might show. want to do it, but within a hot tub. 
Wherever the guest comes in, the guest comes in the hot tub. naked in the hot tub. Yeah. Well, I'm up for it. <laughs> uh, so when you uh, sit down together, or when you pitch on it to Johnny, do you see pretty much eye to eye? Because it's unusual that uh, a couple who've worked together on so many films are still friendly, are still prepared to work together. I mean, most, you know, most directors I know, eventually, they hit a wall with their, with their leading actors and vice versa. You're on the same page pretty much all the time? Yeah, I mean, oddly, like, you know, like, even when it comes down to, you know, script notes and stuff like that, if we sit down to talk about the character or talk about a scene and uh, compare script notes, and there, there have been times when, when they've been, like, identical, you know, or, or, or the notes on the page. Um, and then the approach to the character, like, with the Mad Hatter, for example, I had this weird little uh, watercolor that I'd done of what I thought he should look like, and then I brought it to Tim, and then Tim had his drawings, and it was like, they, they were very, very close, you know. So, and how, and how is Tim as a director? How communicative is he as a director? Because I'm led to believe that you're not the most verbal director when it comes to giving notes and advice and guidance on, on set. Yeah, he isn't, but I mean, at the same time, he knows exactly what he wants, and there's, a, there's an incredible shorthand that somehow developed or actually happened right away on Edward Scissorhands, where it's, it could literally be, you know, he could turn his head that way or kind of... You know, do something with his hands and you go, oh, yeah, yeah, I get it. You'd know what he meant. I know, I know what he So wants. almost like the way uh, very close family members communicate, or twins, you kind of know what each other's... It must be kind of frustrating for people who are left out. Do they pretend they know what you want and then get it tragically wrong sometimes? Right. There was not that recently where people were just... They, we just heard you guys talking. We didn't know what the f you guys were talking <laughs> about for like half an hour, you know? It was yeah. like... A group, a group came up to me and said that. He said, I just listened to you and Tim speak. Have this conversation. He says, "I have no idea what you were talking about." <laughs> uh, That's why it takes two of us to go on a talk show because maybe one <laughs> sentence will come out. Together, yeah, yeah, we'll get some sense out of it. Uh, I read uh, a couple of people who work with you. I guess they're the producer behind the scenes. Uh, they, they believe that uh, the characters you play on screen are kind of Tim on screen. You're like his alter ego on screen, and, and you don't see it that way. Is that why? No, I, mean, I think you, as you, when you do something, you try to, you know, see make it yourself but the thing is you know you just put a little bit of that in there because the actors are the ones doing it so that's why it's a collaboration i mean he's the one that's doing it so you know he's got a lot of him in there there's maybe some things that i feel in there and you know that's what the artistic collaboration is all about so. but do you think that you're kind of acting out his personality on screen at any of the time no no i mean I, no not really i mean i think you know i'm basically just trying not to embarrass him that's my job, yeah. you know, <laughs> embarrass people. Uh, let me ask you about some of the people you work with, because uh, how amazing it must have been to work with Marlon Brando. Mm -hmm. I mean, that must have been, he must have been someone you grew up admiring, I would have Oh, thought. yeah, he was, he was incredible. I mean, he became, um, he became a great uh, mentor, a great friend, a great uh, uh, source of knowledge. He was, he was incredibly generous and supportive with me. I, I, uh, you couldn't ask for a better... Um, did he offer uh, advice, or did you seek advice from him as a young actor? He would offer advice. He would, he would offer advice to me. You know, he, you know if, I, if he saw me do a, a, a talk show or something like that. There was one time I did a talk show and I, the lady asked me about my kids or something. And I said, oh, they're great, you know, my kids. And so he called me immediately afterwards and said, you can't talk about your kids. Don't do it. You know, and he really like, laid into me about so it. So he had specific ideas of what you shouldn't, shouldn't yeah, do. Yeah, yeah. He just said, don't talk about your kids. Man. No, don't talk about your kids. Um, you worked with him on the Don Juan movie, of course. Yeah. Um, when you get to work with someone like that, are you still someone who sort of seeks them out as a friend almost? I mean, do you want to sort of like hang out with them? Do you want to be, are you impressed in a sort of fan way? Or is it just business or where do you kind of overcome all that? No, I mean, there was, I mean, the, the, you know, initially when you meet someone as, as sort of, you know, a legend, I mean, uh, you know, the, this kind of legend, this, this myth, um, no, you, there is a part of you that's, yeah, but deeply sort of, uh, uh, stupefied, but intimidated. yeah. But at the same time, he 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 made me feel so comfortable, and um, and sort of wouldn't let you go. He wouldn't let you go in that direction. So after a while, this you know Marlon Brando just became Marlon. Yeah, exactly. And and, uh, and he became you know one of the funniest humans I've ever known. You know? It must be. And for you working with when you're directing, I guess you can't let say it's your first day with Jack Nicholson in the Batman movie. You can't let that be. Jack Nicholson to you, you can't be intimidated by him. No, no, and it's, but it's great because movies, making movies is quite surreal, so it's just another surreal moment. And, and uh, no, I've been lucky. I mean, the only one that almost ever beat me up was Jack Palance, and because he, I just gave a very simple direction, walk out of the bathroom, 
It was the first shot of that movie. Please just come out of the bathroom. Ooh, I've done over a hundred movies. <laughs> You've only done two. And he almost beat me up right there on the spot. But had you given him specific instructions no, just about walk the, out bathroom? Of the bathroom? He no. didn't like that. He didn't no, even want to no. do that. I think he came ready to try and exert his will yeah. on you. I think that was obviously the case there. It's bigger than I was. But he, uh, he did the one arm press ups, didn't he? At the, exactly. uh, so he could have kicked you out for years, didn't he? Yeah. 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 <laughs> but you, you used to be a bit wild. I don't know if ever you, you were you know, physical like that, but you used to be a bit wild. And that's kind of gone now. You've, you've sorted all that out, or you, you, you just hide it a bit deeper? Yeah, I had it a bit deeper than that. <laughs> <laughs> but you never, do you ever cut loose? Or what kind of a drunk are you, Johnny? What kind of a drunk? Yeah. Well, constant. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> are, you a, are you a friendly kind of guy, a drunk, or do you get a little bit confused? Or, what do you, or you sleep? What do you do when no, you No, it when doesn't confuse me. <laughs> no, it makes me happy. Uh, and you're not really <laughs> that big a drinker, are you? When I'm with him, I am. Yeah. You have to keep up. <laughs> Um, OK, let me ask you about your next project, because you're working together again soon. I don't know if it's your very next movie. Is it the next project you're doing is together, or you have other stuff in between? No, there's, there's, there's a couple other things uh, I have, and then, and then Tim and I are working on, you know, developing this other thing. That we and this is, this is, is it going to be The House of Dark Shadows, is that right? Yeah, yeah Dark Shadows, okay. yeah. Which is well, now, that wasn't that well known over here. No. I don't think it, but it was a really yeah. weird kind of cult thing in America. Yeah, it was on it? TV in the afternoon. It was, like a, it was like a supernatural soap opera that, you know, the kid, we'd all race home to see. It was on black and white, like, in the afternoon, and it was just the weirdest vibe of any mo show I've ever seen. Yeah, a gothic soap opera. Yeah. And weird. so it was kind of like uh, domestic uh, and, and, and romantic entanglements. And then there was a vampire involved as well, is that yeah. right? Yeah, but there, and there some of the worst camera moves that you've ever seen yeah. in your whole life, I mean... and if, Strangely, a lot of flies landing on actors' faces and then still <laughs> just trying to act through it. It was amazing. But are you going to try and do that? Are you going to try and make fly, it look... Yeah, we're going to fill the room with flies and yeah. make the actors not pretend that they're there. Do you ever... If you, uh, if you go to Johnny with an idea, has he ever said no to you for anything? Has there ever been a time when you've wanted him to do something? I mean, we know you've had him fudder whacking now. Yeah. And you, you made him... Well, obviously, he had to sing for Sweeney Todd. But have there been things that you haven't been comfortable doing? Or are you kind of open That's to any challenge? Him. I just always... No, I just... I mean, I always fear the, that he's going to come up with something that just makes me so uncomfortable. Like, mostly like a dance... Some kind of dance yeah. thing, you know? But you wouldn't accept a role if it was a kind of a, a straightforward leading man role, would you? Well, it depends, I suppose. I mean, it depends on the, on the character, you know? I mean, if there's something... If there's something underneath that might be might be interesting, or maybe there's a different way to attack it or something like that. So if it was, if there was, well, I guess something for you to get your teeth in, but you wouldn't do what we consider a romantic comedy, necessarily, or would you? Oh, no, I couldn't do that. No. Jesus. <laughs> I really couldn't. I'd be, I mean, I'd be a wreck. So I bet you get asked, don't you? <laughs> well, I mean, I've been asked a couple of times, but it's just not my, uh, I couldn't do it. <laughs> There's no way. Yeah. <laughs> but you're still, you could be made to look presentable enough, even now. <laughs> If we got rid of what, whatever the hell that is... I know. <laughs> we're teetering. Uh, we're, we're, we could be teetering on the brink here. Uh, how long do you think this, so far, very successful, and obviously, kind of, on a personal level, very satisfying relationship, will last? Do you want to carry on making movies for as long as you both can, or do you have a kind of a, a, a game plan? Well, as long as he keeps not watching the movies we've made together, <laughs> there's still a chance we'll work together, I think. <laughs> what about you, Johnny? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, 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 you know, basically just I wait for the phone call, and if it comes, great, you know. I'm, I'm, Is he your favourite director to work with? Oh, of course. I mean, it's like going home for me, you know. It's, it's, uh, it's. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I'm very emotional. Yeah. <laughs> I've heard him say that Where's about that every bit? director he's worked with. He just says, "Yeah, it's like going home." That's what he says. Uh, great to have you both here. Uh, the movie opens next Friday, ladies and gentlemen. Alice in Wonderland. I hope everyone gets the chance to see it on a big screen in 3D because yeah, it's that's uh, the way it should be seen. It's amazing. Thank you. It's very. It's almost as good as Avatar. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> it's great to have you both here, ladies and gentlemen. Will you join me in thank saying you. thank you to Mr. Timber and to Mr. Johnny Depp?
Welcome to Friday Night with me, Jonathan Ross. <laughs> Oh, Jesus. <laughs> I've just been messed. Oh. <laughs> Don't patronise me, Alicia. 